we all don't like woke for very good reasons. We find it annoying. It's anti-white. It's, you know, I could go on. I don't need to. But I wonder the degree to which the woke faction really is at serious loggerheads with the Zionist faction and, and the Jewish faction. And the woke, they kind of have infiltrated the institutions. And I don't know. I'll just throw it out there. Maybe I'm on team woke at this point because or at the very least, I want the like let them fight or you know like blowfeld and from russia with love where there are two japanese fighting fish and he was like ah uh, yes you know the ussr and usa we let them destroy each other and then we take over I, I'm, I, I'm in that mode of of thinking and if anything i'm on the side of the wokesters i am afraid to announce to the world well, but well, well, one of the interesting things richard is that um the first time that i can remember the the Zionist faction within American politics is having to try to appeal to both sides, right? And there's a question of like, well, who are they appealing to? <laughs> and implicitly, yeah. it is the white population, because I don't. I mean, with, without being a, I don't really think the other minority populations care about issues. Um, by which I mean. How can I put this? Uh, I have never seen a black politician talk about, apart from like Thomas Sowell or something, who's not really a politician, but I've never seen like a black spokesperson talk about normal politics, right? I've only ever seen them talk about like w what would be described as black issues. Right. Okay. So it, it is very difficult to, I think, appeal to those people on issues that aren't that. Right, because it is a, is a very straightforward calculus, you know, give me things in exchange for loyalty. Um, and so I get the impression that that population in general doesn't really care about this and is not going to, you know, they'll get on board if it's like give us money for BLM or something. They're not going to get on board for, you know, support our genocide or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um so, th so then it's like, well, okay, so you're appealing. I've seen some very, very ham-fisted messaging from Israel trying to appeal to feminists and things like this. I don't know if you've seen any of this. Like, they've they've gone oh, heavy yeah. on um, the angle that Ham Hamas was involved in mass rapes, mm -hmm. right? So they're trying. They were trying to leverage Me Too. I mean, it's really kind of almost comically inept messaging, um, but they, they they were clearly trying to get college educated white women on the side oh, with, oh they had sort of messaging jewish women in yoga pants doing yoga while talking about hamas i mean yeah it was a bit <laughs> on the nose um. uh, and then and then on the and then on the other side there's a concerted kind of uh unspoken effort to, uh well it's not even that unspoken it's pretty pretty explicit in this case of getting like um conservative activists like Chris Rufo and others um, basically on side with the promise of putting the woke away, right? Mm -hmm. um, whereby, and I, I mean, I even thought that even then, I thought they were a little bit underhanded in the way that I mean, clearly they ousted uh, the Harvard professor Claudine Gay, right, from her post. And then they let Rufo take the rap for it. And now, yeah. if you have a look at the press, it's all about, um, oh, white supremacy did this. Chris Rufo's white supremacy yes. was responsible for deleting Claudine Gay. Um, and it's like, well, what happens if simultaneously both sides just have enough, have just have enough of it? Um, yeah. Because it, I, increasingly my feeling is, and I, I don't know if you noticed on Twitter that I've been <clears throat> I've been attacking this in a somewhat different way from the usual. You know, I, I think we've had 80 years now of people making very similar arguments, you know, the Michael Jones arguments or 
uh, you know, some aspect of the Kevin McDonald arguments, etc. Hmm. Um, where it's kind of granted, they kind of grant them all these all these things. Yes, they're supremely intelligent. Uh, you know, nobody doubts their talents and all this sort of stuff. And I'm like, well, actually, I do. I do doubt all of those things mm-hmm. because I don't. I just look at the evidence of my own eyes first of all, and what I see is essentially a group that uses a uh, very low class mafia tactics, basically extortion, bribery, intimidation. Um, you know, I, I have never once seen an instance of any of these people have like a good faith debate or win it on the merits of the argument or, you know, unless it's like Ben Shapiro destroying a 12 year old or something like that. Um, Mm -hmm. What I have seen lots of evidence of is, um, uh, you know, essentially the tactics of the mafia, which are, you know, which is exactly what we saw with the professors Right. I mean, we basically watched a Moscow show trial um, of the various professors. Um, it is what we saw with the Epstein case, which is blatantly just a kind of, you know, honey pot blackmail ring. Um, yeah. And it's what it's what we see in American politics. That, that is why, I, I mean, you know, you, you've got the absurd situation now of um, the, uh, you know, South Africa has taken Israel to this uh, international court um, for genocide. And, you know, you've got U.S. spokesmen, like not there's not a single U.S. politician willing to say, yeah, maybe we should hear the case. All mm-hmm. of them out of hand say things like, oh, there's absolutely no merits, there's no evidence to support this, uh, it's disgraceful, all, all the rest of it. Um, even to the point where I would say, the the American political establishment is more on board than many people within Israel, who who, who basically have, uh, you know, they, I think that last I saw there were seven hundred, um, seven hundred people within Israel, uh, Jews, supporting the South Africa case yeah. essentially. Um, now, now, how is all that achieved? Is it achieved by? brilliant kind of brainwashing um you know or is it just achieved by, by the fact that Lindsey graham is paid off and you know is scared that he might get his knackers in a in a spanner you know um so i just wonder about how long you can keep something like that going indefinitely and whether we've reached a point where enough people within the system have basically had enough um and and one of the reasons I I say that Richard is because um, I don't know if you're aware of um, Judge Napolitano. Napolitano. Yes. Um, now I've been watching his show on YouTube uh, pretty obsessively since the Hamas conflict started, mm-hmm. and one of the most incredible things about that show, I mean, there's there's the, there's him himself who was interviewed by Trump to go on the Supreme Court. He ended up picking Kavanaugh. But, you know, we're talking about somebody at that level. OK. Yeah. And then basically every single every single guest he has is somebody who's either worked officially for, um, you know, a White House administration or at the highest levels in the military or intelligence. And I'm like, these guys are going out to hundreds of thousands of people every day, all day, every day, counter signaling the American government, the war on Ukraine. The stuff in the stuff going on in Israel all day, every day, and it's not censored, it's just allowed to go out there. Um, how does this happen? So, I, I, I do, I do think that there may be more to the kind of Q stuff that meets the eye. <laughs> uh, not, not like the you know what I mean, like there, there, there may be people within the American system who are doing their best to try to turn the ship around in whatever way. Um, and one aspect of it is exposing all this stuff. Or um, they're kind of the disgruntled employee who went into it for good reason. And they they see how either immoral it is or just chaotic and stupid it is. And they just have a let it burn attitude. I, I, I think that's also plausible. 
Um, let, let me pick up on a, a couple of things here. Um, a couple of things I want to say. First off, and, and this is something that I've really discovered through Mark's work, and um, and I've integrated it so much into my mind that it, it I, I almost now, I'm kind of a hammer looking for a nail, I guess, to some degree. But the scapegoating dynamic is so fundamental to Judaism. It is expl explicated in their book. It, it is their most important holiday, Yom Kippur, is a holiday about scapegoating. And it's one for Azazel. You push the goat out, you exile him to a demon god, or maybe he's the demon. We don't, we don't quite know what it means. Um, and then you also uh, bleed one out and burn it to, to a crisp, one for Yahweh. And the, if you have this dynamic going in your mind, I, I think it if it's that embedded, if you've been reading this for years, if you celebrate a holiday about this, it's not, if you even engage in actual scapegoating rituals, like one, one person who I interacted with briefly on a Twitter space was discovered to be sacrificing chickens and literally placing her sins into the chicken before it's slaughtered. Uh, the, just this like literal reenactment of something. If, if the, if the scapegoating is that deeply embedded, you are going to just naturally act that way. And for for Gentiles, I, I would definitely say for whites, but for Gentiles, we, whenever you use the word scapegoating, it, it has a real negative connotation. It's like, oh, the, the coach actually did a good job, but he's getting scapegoated for that bad loss against state this year or something you know we don't like it actually we we see we see it as unfair it's almost always a pejorative it's not a pejorative within judaism it is the very essence of the religion in my opinion the scapegoat and so like yeah i agree like rufo is pro probably loves the attention but he's getting scapegoated for what is obviously israeli action against someone who tolerated discussion of Israel, including bold discussion of Israel, like from the river to the sea at Harvard. She tolerated that. She's being destroyed because of it. And then they're kind of putting it on either uh, Stefanik, the congresswoman who was, you know, harsh and, in, in, you know, uh, in, in her interrogation of Claudine Gay, or they're putting on Chris Rufo, the, you know, Catholic Italian a uh, conservative activist who you know holds no bar uh, bars no holds or whatever and it's it's really about them uh, you know just this weird even like inner scapegoating of i mean if we assume that there is a more sinister uh aspect to these tunnels like the inner scapegoating of oh these this extremist um faction the scapegoating of Joe Biden and i would say this um really sincerely in fact so there, there was a protest at a, a church, and this church happened to be the church where Dylan Roof shot a number of um, innocent people in pews. I mean, it, it, you know, obviously disgusting event. And um, people got up and they, they did a, a really above board protest. And they, they said, we're, we're not going to stand for genocide um, to Joe Biden's face. And then they were asked to leave and they left. So I, I thought that was a totally above board way to protest. And, and it was actually in a way respectful. Uh, and uh, Joe Biden, he, he seems almost trapped in this. As, as you said, like people in Israel and American Christians are more Zionist than the Zionists. Like you you have this man who controls a nuclear arsenal and billions of dollars that can be just printed by the federal reserve is all just at his disposal and he's basically saying i hear you and listen i'm i agree with you in effect and i'm working quietly to try to calm down the zionist from their genocidal campaign against the palestinians you see a man Perhaps I'm being giving him the benefit of the doubt. Perhaps I'm being charitable because I voted for the bastard. I whatever, but he he's almost like a, this tragic figure who's trapped. 
and he can't stop them and he sees it very interesting richard about the the scapegoat uh dynamic and i i i um i watch a show called i don't know if uh, you've ever come across this one when her name is caroline glick i've never she heard is a, her. she is a hardcore israeli nationalist zionist right i think she's one of the few american settlers if mm-hmm. that makes any sense like she's american israeli settler but she's hardcore okay um but she had a guest on called david goldman recently who wrote a phenomenal article um basically took basically saying that america is uh, suffering a competency crisis and is basically like throwing away its empire and uh etc um is is this Spangler then, that david goldman um I'll, t- I'll see if i can pull up i think the, it might be the, the article i mean it was a really good article um he, he's a very uh, smart guy he um he wrote for the asia times back in the day believe it or not he wrote two articles for talkies magazine that i um yeah, commissioned it, 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 this is the uh 12 the years article ago is so. called yeah I and mean, it kind of really struck me by how smart it was um let's see if i can find that that article now but then I then I kind of followed him because he he did this uh, show um, uh, with Caroline Glick, which mm-hmm. I listened to with interest. And he was basically um, they were basically very dis- they're very disgruntled the Israeli nationalists with America, right? Um, and one of the things that really struck me about the whole conversation was how candidly they were talking about. Um, the need for Israel to excre- to find greater independence from America, because basically the argument in in short was, um, here's the article. It's called "Israel in the Shadow of Decline." It was mm. for Asia Times, but it was also syndicated elsewhere. I'll I'll just drop it in the notes. Uh, just drop it in the notes. Hold on. Yeah, this mu- this must be Spangler. Yeah, he he's a very intelligent guy i've i've read two of his books uh but go yeah, on i mean I, and and he was he, he, in, in in person too in, in, on this show he was pretty pretty strikingly intelligent as well um confounding my my <laughs> my recent article on jewish iq but um yeah. the, the basic tenor of this interview between glick and goldman was them basically saying like america is a shit show they're unreliable as allies and as friends now um partly due to the, the just absolute decline and in, um, incompetence uh partly because they're looking at what's happened in ukraine where you know they they started a war they couldn't finish they they told they built zelensky up and then they've kind of lost interest over time yeah. um and um it, it was striking though because they were saying like we need to be more friendly with the Russians and the Chinese. We need to find a way of like surviving in this post-American world. And we need to be able to stand on our own two feet. Um, and I just, I just thought it was interesting how quickly, what the, the contrast basically between the way they speak among themselves in it on an Israeli show and the discourse for example, in Washington or from, from a Lindsey Graham or yeah. any of these kind of uh, boomer, boomer Zyokons, um, who, I mean, I wonder if they're aware of that sort of material or if you showed it to them, like what would they do? Would they just take it on the chin or would they just be kind of laugh it off or would they be offended as kind of American patriots? Like, What's well, your viewers in America when you hear that sort of thing? I, I think they're caught between two things because, I mean, remember, I'm, I'm 45 years old, and so I I graduated high school in 1997, and I graduated college in 2001. So I I've kind of seen it. I haven't seen it all, but I've seen a lot actually. I I I can remember the Cold War period, and I can, you know, the the way I've described it was I I remember thinking when I was like, let's say eight years old or something. You know, you're just becoming conscious of stuff. And I would think like 
you know, I was in something like I was protected because I was in freedom and I was out of communism and, and someone in communism was kind of there and they, they could escape maybe. And it, it's how I saw it, but I, but I saw it as very reassuring, you know, like, thank God I'm an American basically. And, um, I, I can also remember the hyper patriotism that occurred after 9-11 that uh, really uh, at, at that stage of my life when I was, you know, an angry young man reading, you know, Herman Hesse novels and Nietzsche and <laughs> this kind of stuff. Um, I was I was just really, really turned off by it. I just hated Bush. I hated W. Bush, that is. I hated the Iraq war. I hated all this flag waving and flag pens and things like that. But for American, for, for boomer whites and, and most American whites, that, that was a time of like total moralization and, and feelings of power and, and togetherness and et cetera. And I, I've also experienced this past uh, seven to 10 years of, conservatives thinking in terms of declinism and like this isn't our country anymore the people on top are evil and it, it's this weird flow and they go back and forth you know trump is like our our revenge against these evil people who are in charge but then also he made america great and we are the greatest country it's this just weird uh i i guess you could say kind of schizo feelings about Mm -hmm. what america okay. is and i think they're it's all occurring yeah, at the same time it, it's it's occurring within their same mind on 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 one level like you know uh, uh, israel is great and we've got to protect them and they're they're one with america and we can do this because we're we've got the best patriots in charge and on the other hand it's like we're led by pedophiles <laughs> you know like i mean it, it's just it's it's both occurring at the same time and yeah that's how i that's how i would i would think of it it you know it's interesting richard um that one thing i think you and i have in common is a kind of contrarian character right um i remember i was at university in 2000 and you know during the uh the invasion of iraq tony blair was the prime minister and um all basically everybody in my college uh i went to one of the colleges in the university of london um was uh off to the anti the anti-war march in iraq and um they came in not in iraq in london uh, it's, it's i think it's still the biggest protest in london's history over a million people when um and they were giving out sandwiches you know to come and uh um you know support the anti the anti-war cause um, but me being such a contrarian, I kind of rebelled against that. You know, if everybody else, if everybody else is going to be against the war, <laughs> I'm going to be like, well, you know, I, I mean, I voted for Tony Blair. That was my original sin. Um, <laughs> and I kind of, uh, I really got into, um, to remember like Robert Kagan and Paradise. Oh, yeah. I kind of convinced myself of like the neocon arguments and, Realpolitik and Machiavelli and all of that. And I, I was pretty much like the only person who was kind of convinced myself that I would, you know, okay, I'm for the invasion. Okay, it's not about democracy, but who cares about that? You know, it's about like some other reason. Um, and I, I, over time, have had to kind of um, unlearn many of those things um, and, uh, and almost end up where everybody else was like 20 years ago. <laughs> So it's inter it's it's interesting that um that and, and I, it just made me wonder if you had been there, Richard, rather than in America where everybody was rah rah, would you have ended up being pro war just due to natural control? That's anything? true. Like if if I if my soul were plucked out of my body and placed in someone in Finland or something, my, just because I was surrounded by anti war people, would I just become a Bush fan? Yeah, probably. <laughs> sorry I, I did a little bit off the beaten trap right it's, it's, <laughs> things like that i wonder about and then it's kind of like once you become aware of yourself how can you then combat against yourself you know yeah uh, 
I've, I've often joked that if the revolution actually happened and, uh, you know, there was a base takeover, I would uh, immediately be against the regime and find reasons to... I'd be, oh, like, yeah. immediately on the other side of it. Um, I mean, can you imagine how awful it would be if uh, the Groypers took over or something? <laughs> <laughs> Well, yes, but I, but if you negativity, like there's negativity for negativity's sake. And then there's negativity that is idealistic because it's, it's via criticism that you can actually move forward with something. So I, I think negativity is extremely important and, and good. And, and, and conservatives have this, this tendency to, want to return to some period that's like trapped in amber or like in a glacier. Like they, they want to go into this big iceberg that is like the 1950s maybe, or, or maybe even the like pre reformation Catholic Europe or, you know, the uh, 1450s or so. I, I, I don't know. They, they want to go, uh, they wouldn't like the Renaissance either the 1050s. <laughs> They they want to just like go into this glacier where it remains the same forever. And I I, I don't know. I just I don't have that mentality. I, I I think you can only by by saying something is wrong and by rejecting something, you are implying that there's something else that's better. If you're simply engaged in negative whining, I agree that that is lame and it's just pure resentment. But if you're engaged in idealistic negation then you are actually moving things forward you know we're hegelians basically you know long story short yeah yeah i'd i'd I'd, uh, I'd go along with that although i have been uh a while back about, about two years ago i got caught up in a whole positive versus negative vision argument where after being burnt i i, I made this video where i imagined a little town called Trumpton, right? Mm-hmm. Which is a uh, this is it's like a British kids show that was shown in the sixties, but like everybody's uh, you know lives in the village green essentially, and you know there's a little uh, there's a there's a baker and a candlestick maker and a butcher, and everybody has a place in the village, and there's a mayor that everybody looks up to, and it's kind of like a like a like, you know a, a vision of the great chain of being is how I wanted to present yeah. it. Yeah, And I was like, well, okay, let's pretend this is something like what everybody wants, right? Most people on the right look at something like that and think it's wholesome and something to aspire towards. There's a community, people like each other, there's hierarchy, there's order, um, there's a high trust between all those people. And then I was like, right, okay, so here are the things that we need to do to get to that place. Step one. I need to take away your mobile phones. And mm-hmm. I had like a full, I had a full, a full scale revolt of everybody. Everybody's like, you're basically Stalin. You're bas- you're basically creating North Korea here. <laughs> and um, and I was like, right, okay, that's it. Positive visions inherently cause problems. So the only thing in the end everybody agrees on is that the elites now need to go. So th- this is the this is the argument I got into with people, which is that as soon as you get, because I agree with you, I agree ultimately that you need some sort of vision that you're working towards. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you try to start articulating it, you get a hundred and one splinter group splinters. You're you're just, you're just asking for the Monty Python people's front of Judea, you know, splinter effect. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I was trying to think of a way of what could what could be a thing that everybody could get behind so everybody's on the same page. Um, that was two years ago. After after living through the past two years, I now think it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Just do what you want. <laughs> Who cares at the end of the day? <laughs> because, um, you know, <laughs> nobody is in a position to be how can I put this we understand the, the need for a vanguard and a counter and a counter elite but the facts on the ground are that there's already in my view a counter elite ready and set to go and they are not 
are of a flavor that any of you would like. They are a yeah. flavor of the, they are essentially the Chris Russo, the Chris, the Chris Rufos and Vivek Ramaswamis of this world. And my view currently is that we need to let all of that play out and resolve one way or the other and um, just kind of bide our time, develop our, our ideas, remain on reasonably good terms uh, until that time until that time comes. Um, but, but not the endorse meantime, the yeah. Chris Rufos. I think this is also this temptation that's always bothered me with the right wing where they're like, well, you know, a half loaf is better than nothing, you know, kind of thing. And I'm like, no, it, it's, it's actually kind of worse because no, it will they, be. I mean, I, they will I, steal I, I, your thunder as well. Like, I've, you know, I've, I've been telling people, Richard, the, yeah. you, you're going to basically get the HR lady replaced with James Lindsay, uh, you know, <laughs> like, like, basically forcing you to not engage with critical race theory and yeah. be colorblind and, and uh, merit, meritocratic while also learning about the Holocaust. That's basically what's going to be like. So, yeah. <laughs> and I yeah, don't, so. I don't, that's not a solution. I don't, I also don't think that that's sustainable. I, you've been kind of joking about this, how like fresh Prince is, yeah. you know, I, I would, I would agree with you that that did work for a while. And yeah, the lethal weapon buddy, you know, like Mel Gibson and Danny Glover working together and putting aside differences to solve the crime. <laughs> like, I, agree, I, I I'm not going to deny that that isn't plausible on some level. It, and it's in a way been done. But I, I don't think that that is possible. I, I think that's also kind of going backward to some glacially frozen period of, of like 1980 through mm -hmm. 2001 where that did work and i don't i i i don't think that that's possible but let, let me change the subject just a little bit because i know we're you're generous of your time but we're, we're running low but what you know i think you and i also agree that the midwits are in effect in charge and yes. and so I, there, you know, I watched this movie on Netflix um, a couple of weeks ago that was produced by the Obamas. It's called um, uh, "Leave the World Behind," and it's very interesting. I thought there was a lot of actually symbolism and messaging going on in that film from a, a, an Obama perspective, which is uh, pretty interesting. But. It, this this character who I think was a stand-in for Obama, who was the wealthy, uh, educated, and and in fact very thoughtful black man, um, named uh, G H, um, yeah, George H. I, I think even the name was like George, you know, Hussein George, first president, first black president, George Hussein. Anyway, um, he was saying like he there's no one in charge at the end of the day. Like you even meet these billionaires and even they are like running off to New Zealand to save their ass when the, when the crisis comes. And even they are kind of powerless vis-a-vis -vis these bigger forces and the destruction of America. So the, the, the horrible thing is not that Alex Jones is right it's that alex jones is wrong like whatever you you know say what you will about demon worshiping pedophiles at least they have an ethos <laughs> sorry <laughs> you know to, 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 to quote the big Lombardi, like say what you will about these evil jews and cabal in charge of the government at least they would have a purpose and kind of maintain it the more horrifying vision is that we're actually led by midwits or midwits have a great deal of power they're not evil and they're not really anything they're not they're they, if anything they're they kind of lean good you know they're they're like the parks and rec people they're they're kind of flawed and silly but kind of good at the end like if anything they're that but they're not in charge like no one's in charge and that's actually horrifying 
that you have all these people who dotted their I's and crossed their T's on their resumes and while they were in college, and they don't have a vision. They go, they're very good at going with the flow. So like if they, if they, if they were applying to college in 1995, they would have been like, well, the, we need to forget about race. We need to be colorblind. That's what, that's the real thing. And if they applied for college in, two, in 2005, they would be like, we need to awaken to the reality of race and identity. Like they, they just go with the flow. There's no there there, but they're kind of benign on some level. And, but they can't save us. And the fact that we have a meritocratic system where you are are rewarded for being test for being a test taker. You're rewarded for, in a way, not being interesting, which is one aspect of meritocracy. I would suggest. I don't know what they mean when they say meritocracy. It it almost seems like mediocrity is what they me, <laughs> mediocracy is what they want. And mm. you, if you get into a sex scandal, you're canceled and thrown out. If you dip into the till of the business or your government, you're like, you know, arrested or humiliated or whatever. And so you never like, it's all these means and not ends. And, and all of that stuff, you, you got a little handsy with your secretary, you embezzled money, you did this, you did, none of that matters at the end of the day. And if you look back at world leaders, particularly great men and impactful people, they were horrible people, individuals, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, and, and I don't even think that they, it's a coincidence that they were horrible. I think they very well might have been great because they were malignant narcissists. And so we've reached this, I guess my point is we've, we've reached this point where like, the the midwits are in charge and they're in a way doing their best and they might even kind of like not go along with hyper zionism and they might even be the our like last defense against hyper zionism but they they even they can't really stop what's coming and they can't save us and they might even be scapegoated for what's coming but anyway this is kind of my view of power and the managerial class in a, in a nutshell what what do you think i mean one of the things that when i when i was writing my last book prophets of doom this was a topic that kept on reoccurring because all of the cyclical theorists in their own way um and uh, i also covered carlisle in that book as well who's famous for the great man theory of history okay but all of them in their own way wanted to recover a sense of the heroic okay um and one of the little discoveries i made writing that uh book i mean it's not a new discovery in the world just something that was unbeknownst to me um and a lot of people i'd imagine uh before i wrote it was um there's an american writer called brooks adams who was actually a, a grandson of uh john Quin quincy mm -hmm. adams and he was related to like the second president, John Adams, right? Um, and um, he wrote this book called The Law of Civilization and Decay, where again, like again, it was kind of Spengler before Spengler, kind of proto-Spengler book. Um, and one of the things that really surprised me is that Theodore Roosevelt was a massive fan of this book. And when he was uh when he was in office in New York before he became the president. He gave this really detailed review of Brooks Adams's Law of Civilization and Decay, which basically like convinced him that he needs to grab the mantle of history. He's not going to allow this to happen to America and is essentially going to become the great man. Right. And it kind of drove his like he took Brooks Adams into his inner circle and he kind of became self-aware of himself in history. And um, it, it's really interesting because uh, Hitler also became aware of himself in history, uh, famously went to bed with a copy of uh, Carlisle's Frederick II, you know, next to his bed, um, and met and met Spengler. A lot of these, a lot of these people who became became aware of cyclical history, then kind of started to think of themselves in those terms. What's really interesting to me is that liberalism, 
and I guess what you call managerial liberalism especially, really hates the great man, hates the idea of the hero, hates the the notion of the kind of uh, Odinic figure, right? I, I, I'm mm -hmm. part part of the hatred of Trump is this. Well, you know whether he's whether he is this person or not is up for debate, but they see him as that. And yes. um, the the real antidote to the great man vision of history is actually Forrest Gump. Right? I mean, yeah, Forrest Gump, who is basically like floats like a feather and kind of wanders through. And it's caught and it's kind of everywhere and everyone but no one. And this is like this is the vision. You have no agency really. Um and it's funny that uh you know, I mentioned Tony Blair earlier on. I remember all his speeches, all Tony Blair speeches. His vision of history was basically that the future as he sees it is inevitable. Okay. But but Blair, in the way that he speaks always posits history like this massive steam train right it's it's heading towards this destination at a million miles an hour and the only choice that we have to make as a country great britain do you get on the steam train or not and if you don't get on the steam train you'll be left behind so so in a strange way blair's vision of history takes all agency out of it by positing this by positing this inevitable future. It's like, well, the future's mm -hmm. already decided. You just have to ensure that you're in the right place so that so that you're not, you know, you're not in the left behind category. Um, yeah. But then ironically, he then spends all his time uh, building a power structure to absolutely ensure it happens. So it's kind of, it's kind of um, yeah. But I mean, ultimately though, Richard, uh, before I go, I don't actually agree with the idea that nobody is in charge. Mm -hmm. um, if if we take Schmidt and Co. seriously, or uh, or any of the any of the theorists in the in the elite canon, there are always people in charge, right? Um, the belief that nobody's in charge, I think, comes from managerial, pass the buck culture, right? You keep on passing the buck, so ultimately you never take the rap for any decision. Mm -hmm. um, but in reality, there is all everything is run by human decisions there is a decision maker somewhere and if it took if there was somebody with enough will and self-belief they could make massive changes um and I, and I, and in a strange way we're seeing other quasi odinic figures whether it's uh elon musk or i mean it, mm -hmm. in his in his own sick way even uh, netanyahu has started to be a or, or putin like these are these are people who are not buying into this idea that they're little particles floating along. They're actually trying to grab history by the scruff of the neck and by force of will changing it, to, you know. And um, this is what Donald Trump could be, but unfortunately, he's a boomer. <laughs>